very good morning and welcome to this uh, public seminar to be given by uh, Professor Daniel uh, Catalan, all the way from Spain. All right, he's going to share with us uh, his view on the uh, risk communication in public health uh, sector. Uh, but before I introduce him, uh, let me just say a few words about the Institute. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Chan Gi, I'm the director of the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understand Understanding of uh, Risk. And this is a relatively new institute and uh, we do research and also public outreach uh, in several kinds of risks, uh, including public health and food safety. All right, this is one of the main, uh, main area. The other two areas are data and technology as well as uh, climate and uh, environment. All right, uh, so today we will focus on the public health. Okay, um, and um, in collaboration with the uh, School of Public uh, Health in NUS, we, are, we have invited uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Catalan here right, uh, for campus visit. And, <clears throat> and this is one of the seminars. He's going to have another seminar tomorrow. There is a research seminar to be held at the School of Public Health uh, in NUS. Yeah, uh, so let me just say, say a, a few words about uh, uh, Daniel. Right, uh, as I mentioned, he's from Spain and uh, he's in fact the associate professor uh, at a very new university, young university, right? Uh, that is called the University of Carlos III of Madrid. It's about 23 years old. And I understand from him earlier this morning that he's very well ranked uh, among the young universities, right? And that they are ranking for young universities below 50 years old. So he's one of the top universities uh, in that category. And his research focuses on communication and public health, right? That's the main research area, but he also does research in uh, healthcare technology assessment and healthcare services, right? And he has uh, done many projects, so some of them are the, that are still ongoing, include the uh, European Joint Action on Antimicrobial uh, Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infection. And the other project, uh, several projects are funded by the Ministry of Science and Regional Health Services of Andalusia in Spain. Yep, um, and he has a long list of publications, including uh, journal papers and books. Uh, and before he joined the uh, um, uh, university, uh, he also worked in some uh, health-related organizations, including WHO um, some years back, and also uh, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, which is equivalent to the CDC in, uh, based in Atlanta in USA. Yeah, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Daniel. All right, thank you. Well, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. So thank you very much for coming to this public lecture. And um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to the Joyce Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk and also to the Soci Hawk School of Public Health in the National University of Singapore for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with you today. And well, I guess that you are here today because you already acknowledge the important role of risk communication in public health to engage communities and to persuade people for a better health. And as you may know, the field of communication is huge. And during this public lecture, I will focus on some particular area, which is the interplay between the mass media and public health. So which are the contents we will go through today? First of all, we are going to have a first part presenting some relevant, from my point of view, a concept and aspect on risk communication in public health. We will go from the most general to the most specific. And then we will, go, we will go to the case studies that I have selected to see some specific examples here this morning. And this is the content, and now I would like to show you the context. And well, as you know, I'm coming from Europe, from Spain, and many of the examples I will show are coming from my ex previous experience from, from this continent. And I'm very excited to be here today because I also want to learn more from other cultures and that's one of the main reasons I'm here today. So let's start with the first part, 
a risk communication approach in public health. And before, let me give you some basic assumptions. We need to, when we are working in risk communication, we need to understand what people believe about a topic, which are the attitudes. Because one of our ultimate goals will be behavior change. So this is one of the first steps we need to, to do in order to reach this goal. And also, we need to understand people's views about a topic, what they see when they see a problem, and what kind of experiences they have about this. So these are basic assumptions that we should have in risk communication. And let's go for a, for a definition. There are many, but I think this one is quite uh, good for our public lecture today. And first of all, risk communication refers to real-time exchange of information. This is, as we know, a two-way communication. So this is something important to keep in mind. Also, something important is that this is between experts or officials and people who face a threat to their survival, health, economic, or social well-being. And this is because risk communication is not only on health, it's in all society, in all fields in society. But today we are going to focus on public health. The ultimate purpose is that everyone at risk is able to take informed decisions. And this is something where we find controversies because some experts, they say that we should go beyond this and that we should have as an ultimate goal the behavior change. But some other experts, they say that with this, is enough for risk communication to let people to have well-informed decisions. And finally, our aim is to mitigate the effects of the threats, for example, in public health or in some other field. So what do we use in risk communication? We have a mix of communication and engagement uh, tactics and strategies. And we have here many, many of them. And today we will focus mostly on the two first, on media communication and social media. And when we are working in risk communication, we should be aware that public health issues are in different levels. And according to this, we need to adapt our communication strategy. So we have from the local, from the very local to the very global level. And all of them are interconnected, but at the same time, they are different with each other. So this is something we have to keep in mind. And now I would like to show you some types of risk communication. And for this, I would like to introduce Peter Sandman. He's uh, an expert in risk communication based in New York. And I think that this approach is very good for us today. So let's have a look to the way he presents these different types. First of all, he says that in risk, we have two components. We have hazard, which is the technical component. This is the real danger of risk, if something is really dangerous or not. And then we have the outrage, which is the social component of risk. And this is how people react to a risk. If people is upset, is worried, fear, etc. So he made this axis and he located hazard and outrage, the two components on the axis. And first, he defined the first type, which is precaution advocacy. And this is when the hazard, the danger, is high, but people is not aware about that. So here we should send messages so people is aware and becomes aware of a problem. And so we need to increase this outrage through this precaution advocacy. That's the name of this type of risk communication. Then when we have a very high outrage, but very little hustle, we are doing outrage management. And here our goal, our focus will be to calm down, to try to relax our public about a certain topic. There is no real danger, but they are very worried about something. 
So here, our objective will be to reduce it. And then another type of risk communication is crisis communication. It's also part of it. And here we have big hazard and also very big outrage. And the public, they have reasons for that. So our ma main objective here is to guide our people, our public, to find a solution and to try to achieve a goal in order to overcome with this problem. And then when there is no outrage and there is no hustle, it's not our business. So this is the last part that was not filled in the graphic. Then through risk communication, we are doing mainly these three kind of activities. We are making people aware who are ignoring something that is rightfully dangerous, that's precaution advocacy. We are calming down people who are very worried about something that's not dangerous, that's outrage management. And we are guiding people who are very worried about something, but it's also very dangerous. That's crisis communication. And I would like to show one of the models. There are many models about behavior change, but I selected this one, which is from my point of view, a simple one, uh, and it still is useful for our public lecture today. So we start, sorry, we start here in knowledge. We try to increase knowledge in our public, and it will contribute to the individual perception. And this is very important because the individual perception is also composed by other modifying factors like age or previous health condition. And this will create an attitude about something. And this is a very important step before behavior change. So let me show you an example on this. 10 days ago in my country, in Spain, we had very important uh, rains, very heavy rains. And people was advised about this and that it was going to come. So the authorities, they alerted people that they, if they lived in low areas, they should go away from their homes because it was a very high risk of flood. However, some people, they decided not to leave their homes. They thought that they were safe, that they, they were not at risk. And we've had 10 days ago in Spain, situations like this one. So these people, when they found themselves in a very uh, risky situation, they had to escape in some way. Some of them, they had to do it in any way, and some of them were rescued by helicopters. And here, when we look at this, we understand that there are two types of risk. We have the real risk, and then we have the perception of risk, individual perception of risk. And this is something that happens not only in this case, but in many natural uh, disasters. It's, we always find this, that this individual risk is considered something very important. And also in public health, we have to keep this in mind. So we said before that to change behavior is our ultimate goal. But we have different means for this. In communication, uh, we have a lot of different strategies. But communication is not the only strategy. And sometimes communication does not work with some specific behaviors. So in order to start thinking in communication, we should start thinking in behaviors. And then we will see if communication works according to evidence, to previous evidence, or other interventions. Sometimes it's a combination of both, but sometimes they are separated. So we need to start with this behavior approach. And then if communication really works, then we have multiple possible communication strategies. And here we start thinking about all these things, behavior, what kind of behavior, what kind of audiences we should target in our campaign, 
what kind of messages we should draft, what kind of creativity we could use, etc. And we can make a very great job here, but this is not enough. Some public health campaigns are a failure because we only think on this. We need to think beyond, and we need to also to plan the get getting exposure strategy. This is a very important element, and it should be linked to the previous strategies I just mentioned. So, uh, in order to have a very high uh, exposure in our public, this is one of our aims in many mass communication campaigns, we have different strategies. For example, we have the mass media. We have newspapers, radio, TV, television, etc. And according to the agenda theory, uh, agenda setting theory, and some other uh, evidence-based research, uh, we know today that the mass media are, are very important tools to shape beliefs and attitudes, and also to present the public which are the most important topics to consider about health. So having this into account, it's very curious to see that if we analyze all health content in the media, in the TV, newspapers, radio, etc., I would say that if only one percentage of all this content is guided by public health departments, I would be surprised. We are losing a great opportunity to really inform our people about health. Most of this content in the media are prepared by journalists without a specialization in health. They are generalists journalists. And they are writing today about health. Tomorrow they are writing about a new museum in the town. And they are sifting with topics. So they are not really on health. And they are still sending messages about health to the population. So this is something that we will talk more about this later. But also, we don't have only the traditional media. We also have the new social media. And this is great especially when we become viral, when one of our public health campaigns uh, are visible by many people in Twitter, in Facebook, in YouTube, or in Instagram. And, but becoming viral is something very hard. Actually, only one every 10,000 public health campaigns become viral. And becoming viral is not equal to effect. And let's look to an example in order to understand this. I think you all know this ALS Ice Bucket Challenge from five years ago. And well, this campaign tried to promote awareness about the disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And well, when you see this picture, I think you know what I mean. So it was very visible in society. However, if we analyze how uh, this impact uh, lasts in time, we find very interesting results. For example, today we have Google Trends. I think you, you know Google Trends. It's one uh, software that is very uh, good for research, especially when we want to see the number of searches about a specific topic. And also, we can identify uh, different geographical areas and to see uh, how a certain topic is searched in different places. This is very much used also in epidemiology. So we, I checked, as we are in Singapore, I checked how it was here. And I found a very interesting graphic, as you can see. So we can observe that the peak was exactly in August 2014. However, after this month, it came down, and it, was, it came down almost to zero. It means that the effect was not so much in the long term. So this is a very good example to show that social media are very good, but very powerful tools, but they by themselves are not enough. We need more. We need this follow-up, and maybe other strategies after this. And now let's go a little bit about the, what's the role of the mass media in society? And for this, I would like to show you this concept of 
reflexive modernization. And well, this concept refers that the main institutions of late modernity, including health and science, have become the main generators of risk. And actually, through the mass media, we are also spreading risk in society. And that's why some governments, they are, and some public health departments, they are trying to, for example, control uh, the advertising about health issues in the society. So mass media are described as key sites for risk and reflexive modernization. Uh, think, for example, in smoking. Now the advertisement of smoking and alcoholic drinks are very much limited in very many countries in the world. And this is because we are also spreading not positive and uh, pro-public health information, but also we are, through the mass media, uh, spreading uh, negative information according to public health. And now I would like to go to this term, to this other approach, science in society. And for this, I would like to introduce this book. It has been published very recently, two months ago. And the author is one of my closest colleagues at my university, uh, Professor Carlos Elias. And he has um, very well described how is science understood today in society. And he uh, supports that there is a current decline a state of science in Western countries and their government. The prestigious position of science in Western societies is declining very much. However, we find, we can see very clearly, a rise and influence of a rationality in the media and social network. And this is influence, influencing very much to the perception of science. And also, we are involved, we are around of, of many fake news, post-truth, and pseudo-scientific movement in our society. For example, I guess that you have heard about those who think that the Earth is flat, for example, or those who are against climate change. There are many movements around us supporting pseudo-scientific uh, content. And in this book, uh, Professor Elias has also made a very interesting comparison between Western and the ASEAN culture. Uh, so today, as I'm here, I just would like to show you this comparison he made because I think it's very interesting and also I would like, I would like to see your reaction to this. And he first says that in Western countries, the students, for example, at universities, are decreasing in STEM degrees. STEM is an acronym for uh, the bachelor degrees about science, technology, engineering, and math, mathematics. And of course, if there are less students in this degree, there will be less budget assigned at the university level for this education for science, for basic sciences. And also, he described how in Western countries, press, television, and social, even social sciences academics, they are becoming increasingly critical towards science. For example, they are uh, writing uh, some articles, some papers about how uh, some uh, bias in, for example, clinical trials and how science is not so much uh, clear or so, so much good as it is supposed to be and this kind of uh, approaches. So this is also something uh, which is affecting to public understanding of science. And on the other hand, we have Asia. And Professor Elias is dec describing in this book that there is a very rapid technological and scientific progress in these countries. And also he found that most prime ministers are scientific, scientists or engineers. This is something that we don't have in our country. This is something more particular from this part of the world. So there is a very big support from the political level to science compared to other countries. So this is a, an interesting comparison I wanted to bring here to this public lecture. So I think it's time now to go to the case study and to see some concrete examples in public health. Well, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, those, of, those of you who are not very much in public health. 
maybe you have not heard about this, but early this year, the World Health Organization published a report uh, showing the 10 threats to global health. And they, these experts supporting this report, they identified these 10 threats in 2019. And for these case studies, we're going to select two of them. I will select vaccine hesitancy and also antimicrobial resistance. And let's start with the first one, vaccine hesitancy. Well, for those of you who are not familiar with this term, when we are talking about this, we are talking about people who is in this line. In vaccine, in vaccination, we will always find a very small percentage of people who is against, fully against vaccination, and they are here. Then we will have, fortunately, a large number of people who is supporting vaccination. But in the middle, we will have some people who is unsure, who is delaying vaccination to their kids, for example, or they just don't want to get some vaccines, but not any vaccine, you know? So we, we find a lot of different uh, profiles in this vaccine hesitancy. But this anti-vaccine movement is not something new today. This is um, existing from the invention of the first vaccine. So it has been always there. However, what is different is that now is a very much visible movement this anti-vaccine lobby. Why? Because now we have social media and it's very easy just to publish our thoughts, our opinions, and to support others. One. So this is the real difference to the past. So that's why we are having this kind of uh, difficulties at the moment in public health. If we go to this map, and this data has come from a project which is called the Vaccine Confidence Project, led by Heidi Larson. And I am very pleased to see that colleagues from the Soci Hawk School of Public Health have participated also in this project. And well, here in this world map, we can see that the countries with more vaccine uh, and trust are here in Europe, in France, in Italy, also in Russia, also some here in Asia. And, but as I said before, from our experience, the, from my own experience, there in Europe, we have France as the worst country, according to this. Actually, 40% of population, they think that vaccines are not safe. And this is a big, a big problem. Fortunately, not all these people is refusing to get vaccinated or to vaccine their kids, but they think all vaccines uh, could not be safe. So I think that we don't need to say here that vaccines work. We, I think we, we support, we are supporting vaccination and there are many reasons why and many others. But we need to see that vaccination is not decreasing only because this untrust in vaccination. There are many reasons why vaccination is, decre is decreasing worldwide. And these are some of them. Maybe because of lack of access in some cases. Maybe because vaccine shortages, compla complacency towards disease risks, misinformation, decrease of public confidence, and disinvestment. So as you can see, there are many other reasons. It's not only uh, the loss of confidence in vaccination. So we need to listen. We need to listen our public. And for that, we interview them. For example, in our research project, I have been involved. We interview uh, patients on what they think about vaccination. And not patients, but sorry, the general public, what they think about vaccination. And for example, here we have a case of a mother, a new mother, first time, 25 years old, and she gave us this information. It's all about money from the pharmaceutical companies. I think the immune system builds itself. And if it's broken somewhere, it becomes complicated. And maybe the basic idea of a vaccine is very good, she adds. But the vaccine we have today, 
are not good enough. So when we are working in public health and we are planning a communication strategy, we need to listen carefully to what they think about the problem. And this is something, this is a clear example on that. So in Europe, we are very concerned on this situation. And very few days ago, we had this global vaccination summit. And here, it was a high level meeting and the World Health Organization, the general director is here, met with our European Commission president and other 400 experts around Europe from, coming from the very different fields. And it was very uh, important meeting for one full day with a lot of different parallel sessions, etc. And there are some key uh, arguments that they, that they discussed during this meeting. For example, they say that one of the main problems on this vaccine uh, and trust is that current parents, they are not suffering vaccine preventable diseases. So they are not focusing on the health threats that they could produce to their kids. They are more focusing on the safety issues of this vaccination. So that's, that's one of the, of the problems. Also, they mentioned that the scientific community is very much supporting vaccination, but this is not necessarily the same in the general public. So we need to understand that we in the scientific community, we are very much used to work with uncertainty. We know that we will never have 100 percentage of effectiveness in a scientific clinical trial. However, this is not the same in the general public. Even if we have only one percentage of unsafety, people will feel insecure. They will feel worried about that. And especially if this 100 percentage is very much published by anti-vaccine lobby and people and movement. So this, this, these were some arguments that were discussed during this Global Vaccination Summit. And in the end of the day, they published these 10 actions towards vaccination for all. And I'm not going to present all these documents. This is published in the internet. But I would like just to show the number nine. And here is very much related to our field. How is risk communication? The importance of dealing with the mass media and also the importance of being part and being involved in campaigns in social media. So. This, this was very much a knowledge during this vaccination, global vaccination summit. So let me show you now this, another model that we have in order to increase vaccination. And here we can see that in order to motivate people, sorry, in order to motivate people to increase vaccination, we can see that we need to inform people and to know what they think and what, how they feel. So we need to understand this perceived risk in the way we defined before in the introduction of this lecture. And also we need to understand social processes. For example, we need to stop rumors on vaccination. There are many of them. So we need to start with that. And if we work through risk communication with these two important areas, we will be able to start motivating people to increase vaccination. And which are the possible solutions? Well, um, these are some of them that were identified by this global vaccination uh, action plan. And they say that we need to have ongoing community engagement. This is something that we have to keep ongoing. Also, we need to focus on trust building in the healthcare system. For example, in France, there is a very uh, low trust in politicians and also in the health system because of some scandals and controversies in the past. So they need to build on this. Also, we have to be very active in this vaccine hesitancy prevention. Also, we need to have this regular national assessment of concern. We need to stop these rumors I mentioned before and to keep an eye in a permanent basis on this. And we need to have a very effective crisis response planning. Why? Because um, safety issues 
vaccination will happen always. So we need to be ready to answer this crisis uh, whenever they come, because they will, they will come sooner or later. So in relation to the mass media, please let me show you some of the conclusions we uh, published in some articles that we have done in the last two years. So we found that it's very important to improve the collaboration between public health departments and the mass media. We need to work more together. And we need to, for example, to train health journalists or generalist journalists so they become more familiar with health issues and they become also more proactive for the public health messages. Also, we need uh, to, if we work together with the media, we will see that the message will be more positive. The tone about vaccination will be more positive. And actually, if we compare, in, we have made a research in some European countries, and if we compare uh, the last five years, we can see that the tone of, about vaccination in newspapers has changed from more in a negative and neutral to more a positive tone about vaccination. And it is a result of this collaboration and on, on this awareness of journalists about this public health issue. Also, we need to keep in mind this, the journalistic rule of balanced reporting. And in the faculties of journalism, in the schools of journalism, they have this uh, kind of approach when they tell the students that when they write about a topic, they should cover the two sides, the two views of a topic, and they should provide the same space to the different views. Mm -hmm. But in the case of vaccine, we shouldn't and we don't recommend to follow this general rule in journalism. Why? Because we cannot compare the views from a scientist, which are evidence-based with a scientific methodology, with the views of a person who has a negative opinion about vaccination. These two views are not equal. They cannot have the same space in a newspaper, in an article. So we deal with journalists in order to make them understand that the views from scientists are more, much more important and powerful than other views. So this is also important to keep in mind. And also, journalists need more specialized training on health reporting, as we mentioned before, and they need to use more scientific sources. We found that journalists are very much used to use political sources and also general public sources, testimonies, for instance. But we didn't find so much scientific, uh, scientific papers used by journalists and interviews to scientists. They should be much more promoted in the mass media. So let's go now to the second, to the second uh, case study. And as I said in the beginning, we are going to look at the antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, the acronym. So what is this AMR? Well, I think you all are familiar with this uh, public health uh, challenge that we have nowadays. It's when, other, when some bacteria, as a result of genetic changes, become resistant to antibiotics. And this will provoke that these bacteria will survive even in the presence of antibiotics. And it will produce that these patients, they will need more expensive antibiotics with maybe a worse side effect. So this is a real, a real and a very serious uh, public health problem today. For example, there are some predictions that say that in 2050, the death uh, the deaths according to AMR will be higher than, for example, those related to, sorry, those related to cancer. Mm -hmm. So the increasing will be very high in the coming year. And here we can see in this world map that it will impact in the whole world, but especially in Africa and Asia are the continents we, where the impact will be much higher about this public health concern. So when we are dealing with AMR from the communication perspective, we need to focus on, on the antibiotic use. Antibiotics, I think we all agree, that are a great 
and that uh, it's a, one of the most important therapeutic discoveries in our society. But we also know that they are now at risk. They are now not so effective as they used to be before because of the antimicrobial resistance. So there are two main issues. One is the overuse of antibiotics and also is the inappropriate use of antibiotics. For example, uh, there are some studies where they found the countries with the biggest consumption of antibiotics. And we can see that in Europe, we have the first, the top leading countries on the consumption. Uh, about Asia, we can find here South Korea uh, as one of the leading countries in the biggest consumption of antibiotics. Here we have another interesting study. I think this one is more relevant because uh, it's, it's comparing uh, how the consumption of antibiotics is changing after all these public health campaigns since 2000 till 2015, after 15 years. So in orange or red, we can see those countries where even with all these campaigns we're having in every country in the world, the consumption of antibiotics is, is still increasing. And in very few countries, here in blue, is decreasing hmm? it's in these 15 years. So for example, here we can see Vietnam and we can see some other countries, like for example, Turkey is increasing very much. Actually, in WHO, they are putting a lot of efforts in this country to make aware not only people, but also healthcare professionals to reduce this high use of uh, antibiotics. But when we work in risk communication and antibiotics, we are working on this approach, the one health approach. So it's not only focusing on human health. Also, we need to look at healthy animals, this approach, and also healthy environment, because we find very often this relationship of human health with environment health and the way we are treating our environment to produce more and faster and also with animals they are receiving many antimicrobials in order to grow faster for example and that's why in 2016 the un convened a high level meeting to deal with this issue, antimicrobial resistance. And this is something very important. Why? Because this was in the history, the fourth time the high level meeting in the UN dealt with a health topic. The previous three health topics were about HIV, non-communicable diseases, and Ebola. So we can see the importance of this uh, public health challenge, not only for the country, but also for the UN. And another survey found, it, it was very recent, a couple of months ago, they inter interview, survey many healthcare professionals, and they ranked the 10 health threats that were published by WHO, and they asked which were the most important ones. And AMR was ranked as the second one by these healthcare professionals. So we can see that healthcare professionals, they know that this is a very important issue, but the problem we found that the problem is in the general public. They are not still, they are not yet very much aware of this. So that's why uh, we are working in this European project, the Joint Action Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infections. And I am very happy to be part of this project, especially in the working package on communication. There are different uh, working packages, and we are uh, from Spain coordinating the communication of this project and to making this more aware in the general public in the 28 European Union member countries, together with the Spanish Agency of Medicine. So, uh, from this, let me give you some of our uh, objectives. For example, the key messages to the general public to prevent AMR should concentrate on these three areas. First, in preventing infection. Second, to limit antibiotic use. And third, to prevent transmission of these infections. So these are the three main uh, message areas that we are working on. And 
why we should improve public awareness about responsible use of antibiotics? Because it is very important to know how people uh, use them and when people use antibiotics. Because we understand that the high prevalence of antibiotic resistance is correlated to the low levels of public awareness. So this is very much related. And in Europe, still one every six uh, citizens they, for example, use antibiotics for the flu or for a cold. Here we have uh, some latest uh, statistics on uh, from where Europeans get information about uh, antibiotics. And we can see that the news in blue, they are the highest percentage. And this is the growth data. And in some countries, like in the Netherlands, and um, uh, in some others, like in Sweden and so on, the mass media are number one in delivering information about antibiotics to the population, even uh, higher than medical doctors. And just to finish with this case study, I would like to show this one of the, our latest publications, uh, which is related to this European project. And we try to understand how uh, media, uh, how is media communication about vaccination? And we found that there are many alarming messages. For example, that this is a rising problem, that antibiotics soon will become useless. Also, we need that bacteria, sorry, that bacteria, superbugs and infections are considered as the enemies that should be beaten. Also, we found a simplistic uh, coverage by the media and a very poor usage of ev uh, evolutionary explanations of this problem and also a very poor support of visual elements, visual uh, sources like graphics, infographics, photos, etc. Also, we found a tendency on allocating responsibility to external causes instead of telling the people that this is a very individual responsibility. Also, we didn't find many mobilizing messages like what kind of solutions and measures people need to do. And something also important is that we didn't find many uh, coverage about the role of the farming industry and also the pharmaceutical industry on this. Also something interesting is that healthcare workers, experts and professional bodies are not frequently used as sources. So it leads that celebrities, uh, public, they are public and politicians, they are unchecked when they are speaking in the media about antibiotics. So there are also a strong bias in newspaper coverage, for example, in relation to use these metaphors and to give the responsibility to the dirty hospitals. And just to finish with this, also we found that from the messages in the media, less than 5% of the articles uh, spoke about that antibiotics were only effective against bacteria. But this is a big issue, especially in Europe, and it still is not very much presented in the media. And less than 1% mentioned that the importance, uh, talk about the importance of completing a course of antibiotics. And this is also a very important topic to present in the media, but it's not the case. And, but however, uh, we can see, and this, is public, this was recently published by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, we can see that through all the different projects in Europe, uh, we can observe that the increase, there is an increase in knowledge by different audiences. We also can see that there is more political attention on this. Also, there is new research into new antibiotics. This is something important in this field. And also there is a sense of emergency in the population and in the healthcare professionals uh, higher than before. So we see some improvement in the last year. And before we finish this lecture, I would like to show you some relevant aspects, some perhaps recommendations. So we need to listen to the other side. We need also to respect facts. We need to find uh, ways for responsible speculation and also to proclaim uncertainty. This is something common in science, but our public is not uh, 
familiar with this. We need to educate them in this uncertainty uh, phenomena. And also we need to avoid treat the public as ignorant about science. Sometimes we find very simplistic coverage of these issues in the media. And some take home messages. Well, many, uh, we find that there are many toolkits, many guidelines, but still risk communication is a gap in many public health departments according to the World Health Organization. Media professionals should be also targeted in public health campaigns and the public and health threats are changing. So we need to keep changing our communication strategies as they do in society. And finally, we need to keep in mind this active listening, this empathy and engagement that are essential in our communication planning. So, thank you very much for this attention. Hi, I'm Olivia from the LRF Institute. I completely agree with you about the importance of uh, risk communication in these public health issues. But in the case of um, antimicrobial resistance, wouldn't it be the case that in Europe, uh, antibiotics are prescription drugs? So how are people getting hold of antibiotics to treat flu or colds, if not by a doctor? In which case, isn't a big chunk of dealing with the problem about communicating to doctors, to health professionals. Mm -hmm. Also, um, on your uh, first one about uh, vaccination hesitancy, I read a couple of interesting articles about how health professionals are just as unlikely to take flu vaccines as the general public are. Um, and there's some interesting work kind of looking into the reasons for this, that health nurses might sort of feel themselves to be strong and healthy or have concerns about the reliability of the information that they receive. Now, if nurses feel like that, maybe the rest of us are, uh, have good reasons to feel like that too. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on both of those. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Well, first, the uh, antimicrobial resistance. Yes, um, the point in Europe, yes, you are right, is uh, prescribed drugs. Uh, however, um, in many countries, they prescribe more drugs than needed by patients. So they kept when they finished the treatment, they kept these pills, these antibiotics uh, at home. So they are using them in further, for example, flu or colds or some other uh, uh, diseases. And this was identified as a very important problem. So now in many countries, in not only in Europe, but in the world, they are prescribing a number of pills to patients to prevent this. So this is something that is changing now. And, and well, and also uh, they found that even healthcare professionals, they have a tendency to prescribe much more antibiotics than they should, pres they, they should prescribe. Um, and that's why some of the campaigns and some of the messages are targeting healthcare professionals. We need to educate also to them. But uh, as I mentioned in one of my slides, uh, nowadays healthcare professionals are very much aware about this problem. So I would say that it was the situation maybe five years ago. Now it's decreasing. Um, the, the prescription of antibiotics is coming to a, a, a better number in many of the European countries. It's improving little by little. Thanks for from all this effort. And about vaccine, yes, I uh, thank you also for, for this other question. I, I really enjoy um, discussing and talking about this. Uh, we find something very interesting uh, that is that, for example, the flu vaccination, uh, some medical doctors, some nurses, they don't even vaccine themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is a real thing, very low percentage compared to, to uh, if we make some comparisons, we find that uh, they, they feel that they don't need, they, they, they see the need in the patients in the society, but they don't, they don't see the needs in themselves. And here I would mention this uh, bias in risk perception that they might have. Uh, one, uh, there is a, a term which is called a uh, positivism bias, and it is a tendency when they think that they are luckier than others. Um, there is something that is very 
uh, dangerous, but it's not going to be dangerous for men. So it could be one of the reasons why uh, the, the healthcare community is not very much vaccinating themselves, but they are suggesting vaccination to patients. So this is something interesting, and you know I'm really enjoying uh, moving forward our research on this. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. I was interested in what you said about journalistic bias in reporting in the media and presenting the science arguments perhaps more strongly or more frequently than a non-science argument. Um, and in particular to do with the pseudoscience movement. So for example, homeopathy. So homeopathy is, um, well, personally, what I would consider pseudoscience in terms of medications and drugs and vaccines. But certainly there are very many countries in the world and very many people in the world who feel very strongly about homeopathy and the benefits of that. And in fact, there are homeopathic vaccines that are available. So I just wondered how, whether you have any suggestions on how that is addressed in the media, how you persuade journalists um, to um, perhaps present a more scientific argument for that. And, you know, especially in countries, for example, in Germany, where they do use a lot of homeopathy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is a very um, current uh, topic in the mass media and also in public health community. Uh, actually, for example, in Spain, uh, homeopathy is now considered from the Ministry of Health as a pseudoscience. And since then, it has been a very good uh, and a very powerful tool to inform and convince journalists to inform people about this. Before, it was not so clear for journalists because they had also a very powerful communication strategy from the industry of homeopathy. And so that's the situation right now. Right now, in the mass media in Spain, is shifting and is now much more negative about homeopathics. Uh, however, in some other countries, it's not uh, still there. And the European Commission, for example, is trying to recommend countries to uh, avoid uh, this consideration of homeopathy as a real science. But uh, still, some countries are in their way. But I think that in the future, it will be the, uh, the only message, that's my impression, the only message about homeopathics. So I'm very happy to see that uh, from the public health departments in my country, there have been some training, a specific training for journalists uh, working in not only national media, but also in regional and local media. And it has been in that direction in order to inform the, about the latest news about homeopathy. And now we can see that the coverage is very much negative about that. So uh, I'm not sure how the situation, for example, here in Singapore, but I would like to learn more from that. It's a very exciting topic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Powell. I run a company in Singapore called Asia Bio Business. We're risk communication practitioners, but we focus primarily on the, uh, uh, the need for social license around innovation and the use of risk comm in that. But we also do some work on food, si uh, food safety. My question that I get asked quite a lot is, where, what role do you think the private sector has in the process of uh, communication around public health? Well, uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, as you, yes, of course, I'm thank you for that. Yes, I really appreciate that. Uh, however, we need to, to know that there are conflicts of interest behind risk communication. And we, we need to be aware of that, especially when we are working in public health campaigns. And so by addressing this conflict of interest, we can still, I, 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 I think that we are um, in a very good position to collaborate with the industry. Actually, we, in, the, um, in some vaccination campaigns in Europe, we are collaborating with, also with the industry in order to promote vaccination in the, in the, in the population. But we need to understand their goals we need to be very clear with them 
And of course, we need to make this separation between public interest and industry interest, which are two very different things. So sometimes, in my experience, I have always worked in public uh, agencies or public administration. I've never worked for uh, private companies. And from my experience, uh, I am very much into that perspective, is that we need to be very clear with them and to try to avoid any conflict of interest in our campaign. And of course, uh, when we work with media journalists, when they are invited, for example, to a conference and they are paid by any uh, pharmaceutical company to come to this conference, they are obliged to say, to mention this in their writing, in their news. And we have found some cases where journalists didn't follow this ethical way of communicating public health. And so we are you know, trying to promote this ethical reporting and to try to make this distinction between public health reporting and uh, industry uh, communication interest reporting. Uh, I'm Milian from the Saw Sui Hong School of Public Health. You mentioned just now about the individual perception of risk. It's very different from the scientist's communication on risk, and therefore we have disconnect. And you mentioned just now about we, the need to convert a message from a negative tone to a positive tone. Uh, so could you share with us some specific strategies on how you can reduce this connect on the individual perception of risk. Because to the individual, like risk of getting meningitis from measles, it may be one in a million. But to this individual parent, you know, it's, it can still happen to me. So how can we use mm -hmm. risk communication strategies uh, to help reduce that perception of risk to the individual? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we, yes, let me give you a, a concrete example on this. For example, we work with relative risk. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, we find that there are also some bias, uh, which is called availability bias. And it means it's a tendency when people, they see in the social media about a very specific case, and they believe, they think that they will suffer the same. But this is one case among one million people. So uh, when we try to draft messages on this, for example, we use this strategy, relative risk, and we show that, for example, in vaccination, in measles, for example, as you mentioned, we can see that the effectiveness or the safety uh, is the risk of having a side effect, for example, is lower than, for example, a plane accident or lower than a traffic car traffic accident. So we try to compare and to do this kind of comparison for, for the public and they will understand that the risk is not so important compared to daily life, other activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I think we've all been realizing is that some of these problems have been a long term in the, uh, have been in the making for a long time. Um, and, you know, it's kind of in the changing of social media um, and other trends in society. Um, and you talk about, you know, some of the problems with um, a lack of public trust of scientists. Um, and this has been, I think, changing for quite a while. Um, how do you think about long term solutions so we can kind of have, you know, more short term solutions and um, thinking about um, you know, maybe working with journalists, which I, I think can be part of a longer term so solution, but um, it just seems like there's a very big issue that has, you know, kind of been coming into effect. We see um, democracies being challenged. Um, how do you see the bigger long term solution towards um, really improving communication? Well, if we if we look to to different countries. We, we find differences. These uh, laws of trust 
in the political level or in the healthcare system comes from different uh, controversies, uh, situations, different episodes in different countries. So we need to, to, to try to understand the context in order to reach this. But I saw something, very, something in common in all these uh, countries that we have analyzed. And we found that it's very often that the main problem is a kind of, is based on transparency. When people start losing trust in their, politic, in their politicians or in the healthcare system, it's because they have suffered some transparency problem. They have, they have received any lie about a topic or they have received not clear uh, answers on some public health event. So if we work in honesty and transparency, not only with politicians, but also with healthcare systems, I think it's a long-term strategy to build trust and to improve this cooperation with the societies. 